So, okay, so this is um, Finance Means Real Estate. We have Brian Burke here today. It's a huge pleasure to have him on. Um, I wanted to have him for some time. And uh, so he's going to talk to us about um, investing in passive real estate syndication. So it's a topic that many of us are, are interested in. Um, you know, as you guys know, on our um, channel, we have people who invest passively, people who are active real estate investors. We have finance professionals, we have private equity professionals, etc. So Brian Burke is the CEO of Praxis Capital. He will talk about what ultra high net worth investors already know. You can outsource your real estate investors investments. You don't need to deal with, um, you know, like all the hassle of uh, actively managing. So passive syndications are an increasingly popular alternative for investing in real estate. Um, without that, without all those hassles, so Brian is the president of um, Praxis Capital. It's a vertically integrated real estate private equity firm. Uh, so in his career, he has um, acquired over half a billion dollars worth of real estate and including over 3,000 multifamily units and more than 600, 700 single family homes. Wow. And uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Brian. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat. So we're going to do a presentation, then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So feel free to put the, your questions in the chat and I will relate. And that's it. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Brian. Great. Well, thanks, Stefan. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I actually see a couple of names that I recognize here in the, uh, in, in the attendee list. So it looks like you got a great audience uh, here today. And uh, you mentioned something that I think is really important that some of your uh, attendees uh, invest passively and some invest actively. So I'm going to address the same topic to both groups and, and uh, I'm going to word it in a way that's really focused on uh, the investor's viewpoint. So if you're a passive investor, I'm going to be speaking directly to you. But if you are a, uh, an active investor who's looking to grow your portfolio larger than you can grow it using your own resources and do that with the help of outside investors, in other words, you're going to become a syndication sponsor, even though I might not be speaking directly to you in the language that is, um, is giving you all of the uh, answers you need, uh, Think of it this way, everything I'm saying about what a passive investor should look for is something that you as an active uh, syndication sponsor should be doing or should be providing. Uh, so this is actually going to be a useful, uh, a useful 45 minutes to an hour for, uh, for both, uh, both audiences. So just uh, wanted you to keep that in mind. And let's, let's jump into uh, a screen share that I have where I'm going to run through a few presentation slides. And then after I get through these, I'm gonna open it up uh, to questions um, uh, at the end. And also if you have questions, just feel free to type them in your, uh, in your chat box and Stefan will, uh, will pick some of those questions at the end and, and I'll get as many questions answered as I possibly can. So uh, we're talking today about investing in passive real estate syndications and just a bit of my background to show you where I'm coming from when I'm talking about passive real estate syndication. Uh, I've acquired uh, in, in 32 years in this business over 3,000 multifamily units and over 700 single family homes. Uh, the, all that property is worth over $500 million. And, and more recently, I also uh, started up a real estate bridge lending uh, uh, company, and we've loaned over a billion dollars to real estate investors through our bridge lending company, over 800 million just this year. Uh, but I haven't done this alone. I've done it with the help of over 1,500 passive investors who've invested well over 200 million with us. We're probably coming close to 300 million uh, by now in investor equity and over 40 different investment offerings. And one of the most important keys to being able to accomplish all of this, besides just uh, having a great base of passive investors, is to have a great team. And on this team, uh, I've got uh, my chief financial officer, my chief investment officer, uh, 
Uh, and also uh, we started up a private, uh, a property management company a few years ago to manage our own assets. And I have a CEO in charge of that property management company. Uh, between those three gentlemen, we've got over a hundred thousand units of multifamily experience uh, in careers ranging from as short as 25 years to as much as a little over 40 years in the multifamily business and myself with, uh, with 30 years in the business. Our, our primary footprint is basically the entire southern half of the U.S., uh, essentially Arizona, Texas, Georgia, and Florida make up the uh, majority of our holdings. Also now Alabama is a new state for us uh, that we just bought in. And we've got experience in a number of other states, even if we don't currently own there now, at some point in our history, we have owned uh, in those states. But I didn't, I didn't start uh, with all of this. I started very, very modestly. Uh, with my first job as a 16 year old in uh, the grocery business and I was bagging groceries at a local grocery store and I had uh, uh, one of the uh, my coworkers was a cashier who I'd struck up a conversation with and found out that she had uh, bought a couple of fourplexes here in our city and uh, I thought that was really cool and as an impressionable 16 year old I thought that was really interesting that somebody could make you know, $12 an hour and buy uh, multifamily real estate. And I admired that in her that she was able to do that. And a number of years later, after I had long left the grocery business, uh, she went to retire and uh, she, she left the business and, uh, and decided that it was time to start living more of a passive lifestyle. So what she did was she sold the fourplexes that she had bought. And by now they were worth well over what they were when she had bought them a couple decades prior. And she invested all of the proceeds of that sale into a passive real estate offering where an investment sponsor was acquiring senior living homes uh, through a TIC arrangement, which is a tenants in common uh, deal where you can use 1031 exchange dollars to invest passively in a multifamily opportunity. And that's what she did. She invested all of the proceeds of that sale in this TIC offering. Fast forward about 18 months and uh, she had come to find out that the uh, sponsor of that passive offering was a crook. Uh, he was a convicted felon, had been convicted of felony wire fraud among other things. And long story short, uh, the investment went belly up. The uh, investment sponsor stole all the money. My friend lost her entire life savings and this sponsor uh, was and still is in prison. Uh, that story, uh, uh, among a couple other stories, prompted me to write uh, this book, The Hands-Off Investor. And the purpose of uh, me writing this book was if I could help one person uh, invest in uh, passive real estate offerings and prevent just one person from losing their life savings like my friend did, then the effort to write this book would, uh, would be well worth it. And so in here, my objective is to basically expose all of the tricks that sponsors can play and all of the uh, things that passive investors should be looking for when they go to invest passively in multifamily syndications. At the same time for a multifamily uh, syndicator, uh, investment sponsor, uh, this book could be the guidebook to show you what it is you need to be providing for your investors and what you should be doing uh, for them. And I like to look at it, think of it this way, like if, um, if you were about to begin a college course and you could be handed the final exam along with all the answers at the beginning of the class, would you do better on that test? Uh, and I would like to think that the answer to that would be yes. And so therefore what the hands-off investor will do for the, the would-be uh, multifamily syndicator is this basically will give you all of the test questions because the proctors of that exam are going to be your investors and the questions they're going to be asking you are going to come out of this book because investors are reading this and they're investing in syndications and asking the questions that we talk about in here. 
So a lot of good uh, knowledge uh, in that book. So let's let's get into the nuts and bolts of real estate syndication and start with what is a syndication? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines syndicate, which is the root word of syndication, as a group of individuals or organizations combined to promote some common interest. In other words, someone like me, an investment sponsor, uh, and someone like you, a passive investor, get together and we decide we're going to go buy an apartment complex, for example. I'm going to go find the deal. You're going to provide capital. Uh, that, uh, that arrangement is a syndicate uh, and that business uh, is a syndication. Now, not to be outdone, Merriam-Webster also has a definition for the root word syndicate, and Merriam-Webster's uh, definition is a loose association of racketeers in control of organized crime. Uh, so your job as a passive investor is to make sure that when you're choosing who you invest with, uh, that you want a definition of the Oxford Dictionary. That's the, that's the person you want to invest with. You want to avoid the person described by Miriam Webster uh, as the racketeer in charge of organized crime. And this is uh, why I always say sponsor selection, in other words, who you invest with is far more important than what exactly it is that you're investing in. Getting into what a syndication really is uh, beyond the definition, let's just say that you're going to go out and buy this apartment complex. In order to do that, you're going to need two things. You're going to need debt and you're going to need equity. Uh, so a syndication sponsor, uh, which is a, a, a person or company or group uh, that is in the business of acquiring real estate using capital raised from private investors, a syndication sponsor will go to a bank and they will get capital from the bank, which will be used for that debt. In other words, a mortgage loan. Uh, the syndication sponsor will then go to their client base of high net worth individuals, family offices, institutional investors, whoever that may be. Those investors will provide capital to the syndication sponsor who will then uh, inject that uh, money into the deal as equity. So uh, the, uh, the investors provide the equity and the lender provides the debt. That's the typical uh, syndication structure. Now, there's two types of syndicators. Uh, one type of syndicator is what I call an operator. An operator is someone who raises capital from passive investors, goes out and buys uh, the real estate. Uh, the other type of syndicator is a joint venture fund. And what a joint venture fund does is they raise money from their client base of investors and, and those investors contribute money to the joint venture fund. The joint venture fund then turns around and invests that capital with an operator. So uh, you'll notice the difference is, is the JV fund typically will not be outsourcing uh, deals from brokers. They won't be contacting sellers. They won't be entering into purchase and sale agreements with sellers. Uh, they're, they don't have a lot to do with the management of the asset during the holding period. Really, all they do is they go out and they seek out best-in-class operators to, in, uh, to invest with. They raise money from their clients and they invest in those operators. The difference for the passive investor is, is it's important to know when you're contributing funds into a passive investment, what type of an offering is this? Are you investing directly in an operator or are you investing in a joint venture fund? And that, that may seem obvious and it may seem like uh, you would know uh, right offhand which of the two you're investing with, but sometimes you'll be surprised at how opaque this can be. And you think that you're investing with someone that's buying real estate, but in fact, you're really investing with someone that's putting the money with someone else who's investing in the real estate. And you know, the, there's pluses and minuses to this. The plus side is the joint venture fund goes out and does operator selection for you. You don't have to choose operators. You just have to choose a good joint venture fund. So they do add some value. The downside is, is that, the, uh, the, that you've got an extra layer sharing in the profits of the deal. So for example, let's say that the operator is splitting the profits 70-30 with their investors. The investors get 70%, the operator gets 30%. And let's say the joint venture fund is splitting profits with their investors 80-20. The investors get 80% and the fund gets 20%. Really what the investors are getting is the investors with the operator is getting 70%. 
the investor in the joint venture fund is getting 80% of 70%. So not 80% not of 100%, they're getting 80% of 70%, whereas the uh, investors with the operator are getting 70% of 100%. So don't base your decisions on what you invest in solely upon deal structure. It's important to know uh, a little bit more about that structure before you make an informed decision. Uh, there's also two types of syndications. Uh, one type is a single asset syndication. This is where investors will invest in a, uh, a funding vehicle that acquires one property. Oftentimes you'll know exactly what that property is at the time you go to invest in it. The sponsor will show you uh, information about the asset and share the financials and the rent roll and all that stuff with you. Uh, the other kind is a fund. And in a fund, the investors will invest in this uh, investment vehicle, which will then in turn acquire multiple properties. Maybe it's two, maybe it's 200. However many they're acquiring, uh, that would be considered a fund. Now there's also two types of funds. Uh, one type of fund is called an identified asset fund, where in that case, you know exactly what the assets are that you're investing in, just like in a single asset syndication. Uh, the other kind is what we call a blind pool. And a blind pool means that uh, you don't know what assets are gonna be acquired by the fund. The fund manager might give you some type of an investment box where they might say, we're gonna buy uh, class A and B multifamily assets larger than hundred units, smaller than 400 units in Arizona and Texas uh, that are built after 2000 with nine foot ceilings. Uh, or they might just say, we're going to go buy multifamily properties, uh, and you don't know what it is that they're going to get. Uh, in the case of a fund, it's really important that you, you have a lot of trust in the operator because you're, that's really all you have to go on is, uh, is the operator's track record and their history and your, your level of trust in that operator to choose good assets. Now, there's also two types of operators. Uh, there's operators that self-manage and there's operators that use third-party management. Uh, in the case of a self-managing operator, they'll, uh, like, uh, like our company, Praxis Capital, we are a self-managing operator. We have our own property management company. Our team has full control of the asset all the way from start to finish. We have integrated um, financial management structure that is portfolio-wide where we get centralized information on all of our assets uh, and we have complete control of the entire process. Uh, most newer syndication shops or smaller syndication shops or ones that are really spread out might use third party management where they hire property management companies in the locations where their properties are located. And at that point, the operator becomes the asset manager and their job is simply to manage the property manager. Uh, you'll, you'll typically find uh, as firms mature uh, and start to enlarge their portfolios, they'll generally will self, uh, self manage. Now, investing in uh, real estate passively uh, is a very popular thing to do. Uh, uh, National Real Estate Investor Online did a study a while back, and the results of that study showed that 54% of high net worth investors that had real estate in their portfolio uh, invest passively in private real estate offerings. Now, it doesn't mean that they only invest in uh, passive real estate offerings. They might also actively invest but they also have passive investments in their portfolio. The reason that they do that, in my opinion, is because they understand the principle of leverage. Uh, when we think about leverage in a real estate sense, we often think about uh, debt and how debt will leverage our equity to give us higher returns. And I don't mean that. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about um, leverage in the sense of passive real estate syndications. What I'm talking about with leverage uh, is more to several different points that uh, I'll cover one by one. And the first is leveraging of your time. Uh, you wanna leverage the sponsor's time uh, so that you can spend your time doing other things that you enjoy. Maybe you would rather be sailing or golfing or, or even working at your uh, W-2 job rather than out chasing down real estate deals. Uh, with passive real estate syndications, you can invest in real estate and get all the benefits of real estate investment without having to spend your time uh, doing all of those uh, specific tasks. 
You can also leverage the sponsor's knowledge. And your, your goal here is that you can use their knowledge to find the right investment in the right place at the right time so that you don't have to. Uh, one of our largest base of investors is, uh, is tech uh, employees. We're located in the San Francisco Bay Area. And of course, we have a big tech presence here. And we have investors that work for Google, Facebook, Apple, I mean, you name it, all of the big tech companies. And, you know, you got engineers there that are working 80 hours a week and making a lot of money, but they just don't have uh, the time or the knowledge uh, to invest in real estate locally, even if they could. And, and part of the other problem is, is that the market in the San Francisco Bay Area isn't really conducive to rental property ownership. Uh, so that that means they have to travel and, you know, go out of state to find good investments. And maybe they don't know where is that right place uh, or what is the right investment in that place because they're not familiar with those markets. So this is one good way through passive real estate syndications that these folks can can leverage the sponsor's time and the sponsor's knowledge uh, to be able to source uh, the right deals for them. They also uh, can leverage the sponsor's team, not only to locate and arrange opportunities, but to professionally manage the asset once it's acquired. Uh, you'll often hear people bragging about how many units they own or how many deals they've done uh, or how many properties they've bought, but you don't very often hear people bragging about how long they managed an asset or uh, you know, how difficult it is to, uh, to make sure that an, a business plan is properly executed. Yet the, uh, the holding period of the asset is the longest period of the entire syndication life cycle. Acquiring the asset takes a couple of months, uh, managing the asset can take several years. So it's really important that the team that you're working with has a strong uh, management background and can professionally manage that asset once it's acquired. Investors also get to leverage the sponsor's experience, contacts, and systems to source deals that they couldn't source on their own, whether that's because they don't have the broker relationships uh, or the experience or the systems to locate uh, deal flow. Uh, whatever the case may be, you want to be able to leverage the sponsor's many years in business and uh, all of their practice in perfecting these systems and building these contact lists uh, that you can take advantage of all of that, all of that years of uh, business building just simply by making one investment in a passive real estate offering. You can also leverage the, spo the sponsor's financial strength. Uh, in order to acquire multifamily assets, you have to get the debt. Uh, remember there's the debt and the equity component. So to satisfy debt lenders, debt lenders will oftentimes require balance sheets, reserves, and a strong credit rating. And, and these balance sheets can be hefty. Uh, if you're going to borrow $20 million from Freddie Mac to buy an apartment complex, they may want to see that you have a $20 million net worth. Uh, oftentimes, they want a net worth that's equal to or greater than the loan amount, or at least greater than or equal to a certain percentage of the loan amount. And maybe you don't have that. And that would make it difficult for you uh, to acquire large assets on your own. Uh, this gives you, you know, by, by investing through passive syndication offering with a strong sponsor uh, that brings a balance sheet and has cash reserves and a good strong credit rating, you can take advantage of all of those things without having to build them on your own. You can also leverage the sponsor's market research and skill to make decisions uh, that can help maximize the performance of the, uh, of the investment and minimize downside, such as identifying multiple exit strategies. Uh, you know, sponsors, uh, a good sponsor will have access to data sources that will give them uh, in-depth research on markets and performance and rent growth and occupancy and vacancy statistics, uh, uh, construction uh, pipelines and construction absorption ratios, all kinds of different metrics that are important to the income real estate investor, uh, yet aren't always available out there for free. And sponsors that have access to this kind of data uh, can add a lot of value to you as a, uh, as a casual investor. You can also leverage the capital of other investors. And this comes in a couple of different forms. 
maybe uh, you don't have a ton of money, but you want to buy real estate that's more that's larger than what you can acquire on your own. Syndication allows you to leverage other people's capital, and you can now own a share of a very large property uh, that you couldn't have done by yourself. On the other hand, let's say you do have the money to buy a very large property all on your own, uh, and you have $10 million that you could invest in this one $40 million property. So yeah, you could do it. But then the question is, do you want to? Should you put all of your eggs in one basket and put the whole 10 million in one deal? Or maybe you invest in passive real estate syndications where you can spread your capital around amongst a, a number of different properties, a number of different offerings, a number of different investment sponsors, a number of different asset classes, property types, locations. And basically you can build yourself a really nice, well-diversified portfolio where your goal is to eliminate or minimize any particular single point of failure. In other words, investing all in one property has a single point of failure. Investing in only one sponsor has a single point of failure. Only one asset class has a single point of failure. Any one city has a single point of failure. And by spreading your money around, you can get diversification, which will be important to help you protect against downside scenarios. So uh, let's look at an example of why investing in a real estate syndication might make sense for you. Uh, this is just a real world example of a property that we bought two and a half years ago for about $18.5 million. We just sold it for $30 million. Uh, our total cost all in, including all sponsor fees, uh, renovation of the property, closing costs, financing costs, everything was $23 million. Uh, when we sold the property for 30 million in two and a half years, we were able to generate an internal rate of return for our investors of over 25%, a 1.79x net equity multiple, which means if someone invested $100,000, they got $179,000 back. Uh, meanwhile, during the hold period, they, uh, they achieved a 10.5% cash on cash return. Uh, and that's the reason why people like investing in passive real estate syndications. You can get great returns that are non-correlated or at least low correlation to stock market returns. And it gives you uh, an interesting um, uh, a place to put capital outside of traditional investment markets. Now, when you're thinking of investing in passive real estate syndications, before you just dive all in because all that stuff sounds so great, uh, keep in mind that, you know, there is danger out there. A friend of mine lost her entire life savings investing with the wrong sponsor. So how do you prevent that from happening to you? Let's go through five things that you should look for when you're going to invest in a passive real estate syndication. And one thing that you need to avoid when you're investing in passive real estate syndications. So uh, number one is the team. And, and this goes back to my comment earlier about uh, which is more important, the sponsor or the asset? Uh, and it really is uh, the team, the sponsor, the people behind this investment is the most important thing. If you choose the wrong one, you're doomed from the start. Uh, so choose wisely. And let's look for three things that I want you to look for when you're considering investing with a particular sponsor team. Uh, the first one is you need to evaluate their experience. And experience comes in four different categories. The first category is market cycle experience. And what this means is, has that investor ever acquired, successfully managed, and successfully sold and returned capital and delivered an investment return for investors? All too often out there, you'll hear of first timers or people who have acquired a lot of assets uh, maybe they've even acquired hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate, but have never sold a single property. And what this is akin to is it's almost like boarding a plane with a pilot who's been taught how to take off, but has never actually landed. And so you really want to know that somebody has, uh, has the uh, training and experience to not only get you where you're trying to go, but also bring that all the way home. The other uh, element of experience is full cycle experience. Uh, I just got all these backwards. You now see how I messed that up. So that's full cycle experience. Market cycle experience is, uh, is, uh, is people who have been around long enough 
uh, to have uh, seen adverse market cycles. So anybody that's been doing this less than 10 years has only seen an up market. Uh, no down market uh, has happened during the time they've been an investment sponsor. Therefore, they haven't learned to feel the pain of what happens when markets move against you. And they, they might have a lack of respect for the power uh, of an adverse cycle and the amount of damage it can do. Uh, anybody that's been through a down cycle uh, and has felt that pain is going to be really, really cautious uh, and really gun shy about uh, going through that again. And that's who you want on your side. You want someone that's uh, not necessarily thinks the sky is always falling, but somebody who respects that when the sky does fall, uh, they know how to navigate their way through it. So that's market cycle experience. We already talked about full cycle experience. Uh, local market experience is some, let's say that you have a sponsor that's uh, always invested in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, they've never invested anywhere else, but now they're bringing you an opportunity in Washington, D.C., or Tampa, Florida, or who knows where else, but yet they've never invested in any of those markets. They have no experience in that market. Um, that could be a red flag. You want somebody that, that has that local market experience. And finally, uh, the next uh, experience category is product type. Uh, if you have a sponsor who's always invested in multifamily, and now they're bringing you a hotel development, uh, but they've never managed hotels before, never owned a hotel, uh, that uh, they, they lack that product type experience. Uh, and that's certainly something to watch out for. <clears throat> the next element uh, of the team is the team's track record. Uh, we want to see what have they done in the past? How many deals have they done? What have they bought? Where has it been? What was the outcome? How many did they sell? What kind of investment returns did they produce? Each time you invest with somebody new, you should be able to ask them for information about their track record and the sponsor should be able to provide you with some type of collateral material that can uh, give you an indication of what they've done in the past that's worthy of earning your trust. Because uh, that's really what this is all about. You need to trust that they're going to take your money and do something really good with it. And the best indication of how they're going to perform is how they've performed before. Now, certainly they always say in investing world that uh, past performance is not a guarantee of future results, but it certainly is uh, an indicator that you can use to at least point you uh, into, a, into the right direction. <clears throat> then the third team component uh, for you to consider is the brand. Uh, of this sponsorship team. And you wanna know that they have a brand that, that uh, they need to protect and have to protect. And this comes up from uh, a, an interesting uh, question or topic that comes up in a lot of discussions in, uh, in passive investing circles is people will say something like, well, how do I know that you're not going to just completely abandon this investment uh, lose all my money, uh, this is going to completely fail. And then six months later, you pop back up with a new company name and you get to start all over again. And you're still in business doing this. And, you know, I've lost all my money. Uh, it's important to know that who you're investing with has a brand that they have to protect so, uh, uh, so much so uh, that they will do everything within their power to not let this investment fail. This is the old you know, walk away uh, fear. You know, how do I know you're not going to just give up and walk away and, and leave me hanging? And, and believe me, this does happen. I get calls from people from time to time saying, I invested in this passive real estate offering. Uh, I wasn't getting my quarterly reports. Things didn't seem to be going very well. The next thing I know, the distribution stopped. I tried to call the sponsor and they won't pick up the phone. They're not answering my emails. Uh, uh, all of that is what happens when you invest with someone that doesn't have a brand. This guy can just disappear and, you know, six months later, he's, you know, he's no longer ABC uh, properties. He's now uh, XYZ real estate. And you just want to know that uh, that's unlikely uh, to happen with the group that you're investing with and that, uh, uh, that they can't just, you know, pop back up under a new name. 
The next thing I want you to look for when you're considering a passive opportunity is that suitability and, and suitability comes in a, a variety of different subcategories. The, the main one that I want you to focus on first though, is does the investment meet your needs? Uh, if you're retired and you live off the cash flow of your investments, it's going to be very important that the investment that you make produces uh, regular cash flow. Uh, that means that if you're going to invest in a ground up development, for example, that investment might not be suitable for you because ground up developments don't generate cash flow until they've been leased up and stabilized. Uh, on the other hand, maybe your needs are for capital growth. Let's say you have a W-2 job, you're making good money, you don't need the income. What you want to do is you want to see your investments grow over time. Uh, in that case, uh, a stabilized class A uh, multifamily property in a slow growth market might not be suitable for you because that's more of a steady as she goes, coupon clipper investment, more like investing in a bond. Uh, so that might not be the right investment for you. You might be better off in a ground up development or in a value add multifamily or a repositioning project of some sort. So just making sure that the uh, the property or the, the business plan meets your needs for either cash flow or capital growth is one of the suitability tests. Another suitability test is does this investment match your risk tolerance? Uh, if you have a high tolerance for risk, a ground up development might be fine, but if you're very risk averse, uh, a ground up development is not suitable for you. Uh, you should put your money into something that's a little bit more stable and safe. Uh, another suitability test is liquidity. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these passive offerings are very illiquid and, you know, the business plan might be to acquire a property and hold it for 10 years or five years or seven years or whatever. And if you're investing cash that you might uh, need in six months or one year or even two years or even five years down the road uh, might be problematic for you. And therefore, uh, a long-term investment in a passive offering might not be suitable for you if you're using short-term cash or money that you're going to need to access relatively soon. The next thing to look for is the market. Uh, the, the, there's, there's three things in markets that I, I call the big three. And this is what drives uh, income real estate. It drives the growth of income real estate, both in terms of rental growth uh, and it's rental growth that ultimately drives price growth. So those three things are job growth, income growth, and population growth. If you have those three things, it means that uh, rents are likely to climb. Uh, it means that income is likely to grow. It means that demand for your uh, product, whatever that may be, whether it's apartment units, warehouse space, hotel rooms, whatever that might be, is likely to be there for you. Even in the case of a adverse economic cycle, you might still find at least you're better off uh, than you would be in markets that don't have job growth, income growth, and population growth. Uh, now, there's one caveat to all of this, though, that those the, the so-called big three need to be built upon a foundation of economic diversification. Uh, this is kind of what I, I call the, uh, the one-horse town syndrome. And a good example that I can think of for, for this scenario is Midland and Odessa, Texas. Uh, these are markets that have can have at times great job growth, great income growth, and great population growth. The problem is, is those three are not built on a foundation of economic diversification. It's built entirely on one industry, and that's oil. And when oil goes south and rig counts go down and the price of a barrel goes down, uh, now you see instant switch from job growth, income growth, and population growth to job losses, income declines, and population loss. And therefore you see swings in vacancy and you see swings in net operating income and you see swings in property value. So having economic diversification is an important component for you to analyze 
when you're considering what markets you want to be investing in. So look at the market that the sponsor is proposing to invest in or is investing in through in an identified asset scenario. Uh, what market is this property in? And in a fund scenario, what are their target markets and where are they looking to acquire? The next thing to look at, and you'll notice this is fourth on the list, is the real estate itself. Uh, if you found a really good sponsor and you've got a great team uh, and you feel that uh, they're investing in an, a market that is in the right area and that the investment is suitable for you, now you look at the real estate itself and you, you look at the location and from a macro level, that would mean what city is it in, what market, uh, how strong is that market, uh, just like we looked at in item number three, but it also it's more micro than that. Is it at the corner of Maine and Maine? Uh, if it's multifamily, uh, is it located in an area where there's a lot of jobs? If it's self-storage, is it located on a freeway with a high traffic count? Uh, are there a lot of homes within a one and three mile radius? If it's a hotel, is it in an area where uh, there's a lot of demand for hotels. Is it a high tourism? Is there too much hotel inventory? Uh, just thinking about the location from both a micro and a macro level. The next one is the quality of the real estate. You know, is it an old rundown uh, property that's dilapidated, or is it a brand new, uh, you know, new construction, high quality asset? And just making sure that the quality matches the business plan. I mean, somebody can't say we're going to buy a brand new property. We're going to go completely renovate it and make it better. Uh, that would be a mismatch of business plan to asset quality. Uh, yet, on the other hand, if somebody's buying a dilapidated old hunk of junk, uh, you want to see that there's some kind of a renovation component in their business plan. If there isn't, uh, then uh, this that could be a signal of trouble ahead. Uh, so that gets into the strategy component. What is the sponsor strategy? You know, are they planning on doing renovation? Is this just a coupon clip or buy and hold uh, bond style investing? Is it a value add? Uh, you know, is it fix and flip? Is it buy and hold? What does that look like? And does that strategy seem to match what's going on in the overall uh, broader market in that particular area? I always say that implementing the uh, the right strategy in the right location at the right time is enormously important when you're investing in real estate. Take any one of those things out and make it the wrong, uh, then you're going to have a big problem. Wrong strategy in the right place at the right time, still no good. Uh, right strategy in the right place at the wrong time is no good. So uh, just be uh, mindful of that when you're considering what investment you're going to make. The fifth thing to look for is the assumptions that the sponsor is presenting to you in their in their financial analysis or in their business plan. Uh, when you're when you're looking at uh, especially an identified asset syndication, uh, and oftentimes in even in a fund they'll have some seed asset where they can show you some financials or at least example financials of what uh, a typical deal might look like. You really want to scrutinize the assumptions that the sponsor is making in their analysis because they're going to give you a projected return and that projected return is going to be predicated upon them meeting uh, a number of assumptions that are contained in their financial analysis. So some of those are uh, the projected rent. Uh, they're going to say, we're going to renovate these apartments, we're going to rent them out for X number of dollars. Is that projected rent supported by rental comps of other properties that are achieving that price point? And can they show you those comps to prove to you that those rents are achievable? Uh, the next one is rent growth assumptions. Now, if they're saying we think rents are going to grow 20% a year, uh, they might be uh, overshooting it just a little bit. Um, so ask for uh, some third-party verification to their rental growth assumptions. Are they able to provide you a report from professional economists that show that rent growth as they're projecting is possible or even likely in that particular uh, market or sub-market? Uh, the physical and economic vacancy factors, uh, are those in line with the market and are they reasonable? And where you'll oftentimes see this go awry is in the case of a property where, let's say it's 98% occupied. And even though the general overall market vacancy factor is, you know, 6% vacancy, 
you know, they're showing, well, this property is only 2% vacant. Um, so going forward, we're going to project that we're going to be at 3% vacancy because we're being conservative. That's what they'll say. Well, the part that they fail to mention is that the reason the property is only 2% vacant is because the rents are 20% below market and they're projecting that they're going to bring rents all the way to market. And when they do that, their, their uh, vacancy is going to rise to the vacancy of the rest of the market. You can't have it both ways and be, you know, have low rents and high occupancy and have high rents and high occupancy. Uh, those two are like a teeter-totter. When one goes up, the other goes down. So it's important that they're uh, forecasting in their analysis that the property will be more in line with the overall market's vacancy factor, not necessarily the vacancy factor that the property is currently experiencing. Beware of large jumps in first year income. This is one where I've had this, uh, some people have asked me this question, like how can I look at financial projections for an income property and know in 30 seconds or less whether or not the uh, sponsor is going to meet uh, their projected return. And this is the biggest one I can say. You can look at this in three seconds and know if they're going to meet it or not, or at least know that they won't. And the way that I look at it is I look at the first year income and compare that to the trailing income that the property has generated uh, before expenses. Uh, in the last three months on an annualized basis. So I look at the last three months of income, multiply that by four, and then I compare that, it's called the, um, the net rental income or the effective gross income. Either of those two will, will work similarly. Effective gross is probably a better one to use because that includes rental income and utility income and any other kind of miscellaneous income. You can look at their effective gross income uh, by taking the last three months multiplied by four and compare that to their year one forecast. And if you see a huge jump, you'll know automatically right then and there that they're gonna have trouble meeting their uh, projected return and that the sponsor is being too aggressive. Essentially what they're saying here is we're gonna take rents and we're gonna increase them 20%. Uh, so that's why we're getting this big jump. But the truth is, is they can't jump those rents in one day. It's not all going to happen at the very beginning of the uh, investment cycle. It's going to take time for leases to expire, for them to get vacancies, renovate units, rent them at higher rates, uh, raise rents on uh, lease turnovers and that sort of thing. So a slow ramp up to higher income is fine. An immediate jump in higher income is suspect and uh, a big red flag and at least cause for a discussion and Q&A with the sponsor to find out how they're arriving at that assumption. The next one is sale price projection. How are they arriving at the potential sale price? Do they share with you the math behind that? And does it make sense? Uh, property taxes, uh, oftentimes you'll notice that they're, uh, they're not increasing the property taxes in their projection relative to the property taxes that the property has historically paid. And in some states that might be appropriate. For example, in Arizona, they don't reassess property on sale. So the property taxes will go up about four to 5% a year and that's about it. But in other states, they do reassess properties on sale and whatever the assessed value was before isn't gonna be what the assessed value is going forward. California is probably the biggest example. Under California's Proposition 13, the assessed value of a property is set at the time it's acquired and then it increases 2% a year. If they've owned the property for 30 years, you could only imagine that the value of that property has probably gone up 10 or 20 times uh, X of what it was when they acquired it, which means that the assessed value and thus the property taxes are going to go up 10X to 20X after the sale. And you need to note that the uh, sponsor has accounted for that increase in their financial projections. And finally, is the sponsor raising enough money to execute the business plan? Uh, if you're raising $1 million for a, a, an investment, uh, the returns might look great, but if you really needed a million and a half, or let's say you really needed 2 million, uh, your investment returns are gonna get cut in half if they have to raise another million because they fell short. Uh, so it's really important to know that they're raising enough money. I had a guy call me one time and he said, uh, or I met him at a conference and he said, I called you up one time and asked you if you'd look at my uh, projections uh, for my syndication. And I sent it to you and uh, you gave me uh, feedback. 
And I said, yeah, what did I say? And you said, uh, you said I wasn't raising enough money. <laughs> and I said, well, that sounds like something I would say. And I said, so what happened? And he said, we didn't raise enough money. He said, actually, after we closed on the deal, we had to go out and raise another 250000 because there were a number of things we didn't account for. And of course, that waters down the projected return for those investors that thought they were investing into a, a syndication that was only investing X number of dollars. Now it's raising X plus 250000 which dilutes those returns. So uh, an experienced sponsor should know how much money to raise uh, and they should be fine, but an inexperienced one may not. So now let's talk about the one thing that I want you to avoid when you're investing in passive real estate syndications. Uh, I want you to avoid what I call the shiny object syndrome. And what the shiny object syndrome is, is it's the case where this, is, this kind of was, this disease was created by crowdfunding platforms where let's say you want to invest in multifamily uh, passive syndication you go onto a crowdfunding platform you type in you know real estate syndicate whatever it is that you type in and you get a menu of different results here's 30 different investments you can invest in and what people will do is they'll scan through that list of investments and they'll pick the one that has the highest projected return and and that is probably the one decision uh, that you could make that could turn out to be the, the worst decision you could possibly ever make when investing in a passive real estate syndication. Don't make your decision based solely on the highest projected return because there's a number of reasons that you might be getting a higher projected return on one investment over another. One of those reasons is, uh, could be, uh, that the sponsor is taking on way too much risk they might be using very high leverage, very risky debt financing, which allows them to uh, raise less equity relative to the total capital stack, meaning that they can juice the investor's returns. Uh, but on a risk adjusted basis, the juice is just not worth the squeeze. Uh, the other uh, way that this could be, uh, they could have the highest projected return is that they have the worst uh, the worst inputs, the worst variables in their projections. In other words, they could be projecting too high a rent growth, too high a post-renovated rent. Uh, they might not be raising enough money. They might be projecting too high of a, a, per, a resale price. They might not be reassessing the property taxes. Uh, all of those things I mentioned in that previous slide, they might have those wrong. And remember, garbage in equals garbage out. And if they have the wrong inputs, they're going to get the wrong output and they may not achieve that projected return. And this is why that shiny object syndrome, whether it's looking for the highest projected return or just simply the highest profit split or whatever the case may be, doesn't tell the whole story. You want to make your decision based upon the totality of all of the information. Is this a really good sponsor? Uh, is this a really good uh, uh, asset? Is this a good deal structure? What's my risk? What's the financing? Uh, and make your decision based on the totality of all of those things. Now, when you're thinking about making these investments, you, you need to know all these basics of underwriting and, and all of that. But uh, you know, this is not that much different than investing directly in real estate, where you have to make all these analysis based upon uh, market data and so forth. But the difference about investing in a passive real estate syndication is in addition to underwriting real estate or markets or performance, you have one additional component to underwrite. And that additional component is the sponsor that's bringing you this opportunity. Uh, sponsor selection is absolutely critical. Uh, I like to say that a good sponsor can finagle the best outcome in the face of adverse circumstances, but a bad sponsor can destroy a perfectly good real estate deal. So make sure that when you're making your choice of who you're going to invest with, you want to put a lot of energy into making the right choice and spend as much time, if not more time, on analyzing the people and the group and the company uh, as you do analyzing the real estate and the assumptions uh, and the markets. To fill in all the gaps of what we've talked about, check out the Hands-Off Investor. It's available on Amazon or at biggerpockets.com forward slash syndication book, where I go into great detail, about 350 pages worth of detail on all of the things that we talked about today and how to recognize uh, the good from the bad, both in the, in the terms of uh, assets, markets, 
uh, sponsors and underwriting assumptions, as well as details on financing, deal structure, uh, waterfalls, and all the mechanics and nuts and bolts of real estate syndications. And if investing in real estate syndications is something that interests you, you can always reach out to us at Praxis Capital via our website at praxcap.com, uh, or you can email our uh, investor relations department, Bob Dreer at bob at praxcap.com or call him at the phone number on your screen. Uh, if you have any questions, this would be the time to put those into the chat box. Uh, Stefan can pull those questions out and I can be of assistance to make sure that I can answer as many of those as I possibly can. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share and... Uh... Thanks, Brian. That's, that was absolutely outstanding. That's such a thorough overview of passive investing and syndications, really awesome. We do have a few questions on the chat here. Uh, so first question, um, what's, what, what um, comes first when building a syndication, finding deals or building the fund by attracting passive investors to put them, the, uh, their money on or both simultaneously? Okay, so if you're going to be building a syndication, uh, the best thing to do is to start by building your investor list. And here's the most practical way I can explain this. If you go to the department store and fill up your shopping cart full of items that you wanna buy and you bring it to the register and they ring it up and give you your total, you have to pay for it, right? And so you can't just go, oh, uh, hang on, let me go back home and apply for a credit card uh, so that I have the credit limit to be able to buy this. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna go get your credit card first. You wanna know what your credit limit is so that when you go shopping, you know that you can pay for what you just put in your shopping cart. So if you're going to build a syndication business, the first thing you need to build is your investor list because without your investor list, you can go find a great asset and you have no way to pay for it. Uh, you don't have any investors and, and whatever you do, don't listen to the people that tell you, go find the deal and the money will find you. It's absolutely not true. Once you find the deal that you want to invest in, you are under the gun. You have a timeline to have, let's say, 30 days to sign off on due diligence before your deposit goes hard, maybe then another 30 days to close that escrow. You don't have time to go out then and go build a base of investors in 60 days and close this deal. It doesn't work. Build your investor base first. Uh, use example deals, stuff that you would have bought or could have bought. If you had the investors build a package on what that would look like, bring that out to a base of investors and show them what it is you plan to do and get a following before you then go out and find deals. So, um question from Esther. So what do you look for while scaling to new regions, including partnerships with property developers? How does one show interest to work with you? Should they be property developers though located in a different region? So uh, I may not be the best person to ask uh, that question just because we don't very often do uh, partnerships uh, with other groups. We tend to operate on our own, but uh, from my experience in this business, uh, if you're looking to uh, take your business to a new area uh, and you're going to do it on your own, you need to start building a team in that area. For example, maybe you'd go find a property management company, uh, you build your broker uh, list and go start meeting brokers, maybe an insurance contact for insurance, a financing contact. You want to build all of those things to build your own uh, business. If you want to do it with others and just leverage their contact list, their systems and everything else, then the thing to look for is for the groups that are doing the most deal flow in the, in the smartest way. And you want to avoid people that are taking on too much risk, doing crazy financing uh, and invest with groups that are more conservative uh, and are probably going to be there for the long haul. Because anytime you partner with someone else, you're basically attaching their reputation to yours. And if their reputation turns out to be mud, your reputation is going to turn out to be mud. And in my opinion, your reputation is the most important thing that you have. So you have to protect it by making sure that anybody that you work with is solid, 
uh, and is going to fight to the death to protect their reputation and in turn yours. And you mentioned brand, I mean, you guys are, are a vertically integrated company, right? But you do operate in multiple states. So, so how do you achieve it? Because it's one thing, let's say finding a property manager and like building your team in a new market, but it's another thing actually taking your existing team, applying it to new markets or expanding your team, et cetera. So how do you achieve vertical integration in that sense? Yeah, it took us a long time to achieve vertical integration. I mean, we started out in this business like, like everybody should start out, which is to use local property managers that have a physical presence where your properties are located and you know have them manage that property for you and learn from them and watch how they do it. But the way we did it is once we got up over 1,500 units, we felt we had enough scale where we could take property management in-house economically. And, uh, and, and really, the, what it came down to was just luck, uh, the availability of someone that was highly skilled, that had extensive market knowledge, uh, came available to me to join my team. Uh, and that's how we achieve vertical integration. I mean, it's very difficult to achieve vertical integration on your own, especially across markets. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to bring someone in to help you. Uh, Lyle Lansdale is the CEO of our property management company that we created several years ago. And when he joined us, he came from the institutional world where in his career, he had started national multifamily management footprints six times for various uh, large publicly traded national multifamily REITs uh, and operating groups. Uh, so he brought an extensive amount of experience, over 45,000 units of management experience in uh, multiple states across the country over a long period of time, and basically brought that to us like a management company in a box. Uh, and, and he came here and was able to take our properties in-house and manage uh, our entire portfolio in-house. Now, one time uh, in his previous assignment, he took uh, over 20,000 units from, uh, from third-party management to in-house management in 90 days. An incredible accomplishment. And, and you know, someone with that kind of experience uh, can help you get there. I had a call recently from another group uh, that I know, and he called me and said, you know, the strange thing happened. Uh, the CEO of our property management company just quit his job. And, uh, and so did the regional manager. And coincidentally, we were trying to hire an asset manager and both of them applied for the position. I said, well, this is so obvious. I said, you would be a fool not to hire both of them, create your own management company and have those two run it. They've already been running your portfolio. Uh, they should be running it now and they should be helping you grow. And that's just the type of opportunity uh, that comes to people where you've got to seek out talent and you got to bring that talent under your own roof so that you can get that growth without having to stumble through it on your own. And uh, so a question from Mike K. So I've read about a hundred pages of your book. What is my first step when I finish? Uh, well, I guess, Mike, that depends a lot on what your uh, objective is. If your objective is to uh, invest in passive real estate syndications as a passive investor, uh, the first thing you should do is contact uh, multifamily or whatever syndication shop that specializes in the property class you want to invest in, whether that's mobile home parks, self-storage, hotels, multifamily, single family, uh, buy to rent, whatever, whatever it is you want to invest in, you need to reach out to groups that specialize in providing passive investment opportunities to investors in that asset class and start vetting those sponsors, asking them questions, learn about their track record, analyze their collateral material, get on their list so that they tell you when new investment opportunities are coming up in the future. Uh, and I always like to say, people ask me sometimes like, 
how do I go, how do I find deals to invest in? And I say, you're, uh, first of all, you're asking the wrong question. Uh, the question that you should be asking is not how to find a deal. It should be, how do I find sponsors to invest with? Because if you find the right sponsors to invest with, they should be bringing you good deals to invest in. So the first step you should do, go find sponsors to invest with, do your due diligence, underwrite them, ask them a lot of questions, get comfortable with them and get on their list. And then when an investment comes up, you can then analyze the deal uh, and that's all you have left to do. Now, if, if your goal is not to invest passively, but you want to invest actively and you want to become a syndication sponsor, uh, look back into the pages of that book and think about all the things that I said that investors should look for in a syndication company and identify the things that you do not have and then go get it. So for example, if I said in there, if before you invest with a sponsor, you want to make sure that they have full cycle experience. In other words, they've bought, managed, and successfully sold assets of the same uh, asset class that you intend to invest in. Now, if you're going to start your own syndication shop and you've never sold anything, you've never managed anything, you need to go find a partner who has bought, managed, and sold assets and become partners with them. Bring them under your umbrella or join up with their umbrella so that you can be part of their organization and get that experience so that you can then bring that uh, to your investors. So whatever it is that you're missing, go out and go get it. And you mentioned, uh, Brian, you mentioned market full cycle versus market cycle sponsor experience. So how, let's say, how's, has it been for you, the market cycle experience, you know, being in the business for 30 years. So, uh, you know, in terms of like, have you seen adverse scenarios that you feel like having this uh, deeper experience with your other sponsors who are investing just the past 10 years they, they don't have? Like, what is an example from your perspective? The market cycle experience is the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. When the market is going really well and you know, you're selling assets way above what you thought, today is a good example. Uh, that's how things are right now. It's euphoric. I mean, it's like, wow, we're just killing it. We're great and great returns for our investors. Uh, you know, we're making great money. We're, we're, you know, we're having great exits, all that kind of stuff. Uh, then you go to the lowest of lows in an adverse market cycle where you're having very uncomfortable conversations around the dinner table with your family about, you know, why are we taking basically all of the assets that we have and dumping it into loser investments just to shore it up so that the bank doesn't take it back? You know, why are we sacrificing our own personal resources to protect our investors? You know, why are we doing that? Uh, and those conversations are, are not fun. And those days are not fun. And they're certainly days I hope to never repeat. Uh, I managed to survive these market cycles without losing a single property, without missing a single payment. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very proud of that. But I will say that it didn't come with no personal sacrifice. It came with great personal sacrifice where we had to put our investors ahead of our own interests. Ultimately, that's paid off. Uh, but when you've gone through that experience, the last thing you ever want to do is repeat it. And it's important to me that anybody that's joined up on my team has had that same experience. So you'll notice the guys on my team have been in this business 20, 30, and 40 years. They've all survived the same cycle that I did. They all felt pain. Uh, more than half of my team has been enormously wealthy and lost it all uh, and then had to rebuild. And that to me uh, means that they're going to bring a level of discipline that I'm not going to find in someone that hasn't experienced those lowest of lows. Mm -hmm. So what's uh, so last question on my side and before we wrap up, we're already over time. Thank you. Thank you for putting all this time here today. So, so my last question would be, so what's online platform or channel, um, has on your end has been the largest source of investor leads for you? Uh, without question, biggerpockets.com has been the greatest source of investors for us. Uh, I think uh, out of the thousands of investors we have, if I could trace the family tree of every investor in our, uh, in our client base, I could somehow trace back two thirds to three quarters 
of those investors to biggerpockets.com, whether that means they uh, saw me post in the forum or they saw me on the Bigger Pockets podcast or they read my book that was published by Bigger Pockets Publishing or maybe none of the above, but were referred by a friend of theirs. But that friend came from biggerpockets.com through one of those particular avenues. One way or another, I've noticed a lot of our client base has come from that direction. And it's been the largest source of investor leads for me. Now, your mileage may vary. Uh, I don't advertise on that platform. I don't go on there and say, invest with me. All I do is I just go on there and answer people's questions. Uh, but that leads to investors reaching out and contacting us. People like to be educated and informed and and, and learn more about uh, how to properly invest. And, and that has gotten us more affinity uh, than any type of megaphone that would say, hey, here's, here's who we are, come invest with us. That just doesn't work. Okay, um, Anand is asking, we would want to cover how to invest with your company, Prax Praxis Capital. So I believe you mentioned at the beginning some of the markets you guys invest in. Um, you're like in a few different states in Florida and uh, Texas are the big ones for you. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, we currently, the, our portfolio is now in Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. Uh, we, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're also uh, actively seeking additional product in a number of Southeastern markets, such as uh, the Carolinas, Tennessee, um, uh, even some kind of uh, northern and western markets like Salt Lake City, uh, Las Vegas, Reno, uh, just to a lesser, lesser degree because they have a lot less product in those markets. But we have a national footprint, but we're sticking only to markets where people are moving to and we're avoiding markets where people are moving from. And if you are interested in investing with us, you can visit our website at praxcap.com. Uh, on there, you can check us out. And then uh, there's a let's talk button. You can click let's talk, fill out the little form with your email address and name. And uh, Bob will shoot you an email with a link where you can schedule an introductory phone call with us to learn more about what we're doing. And we can learn more about your investment objectives and goals to make sure that we're only sending you appropriate, suitable investments for you to look at. Uh, and then we can get you on our list for future opportunities. Perfect. So you, I believe you just mentioned the best way for people to reach to you, right? So it's uh, your website, uh, get in touch. And so, so sounds good. So thank you so much. So with that, um, you know, thanks to everyone for joining here today. Thank you, Brian. It's been really great. I really appreciate you taking the time and have a good night. Happy to do it, Stefan. Thanks for the invite.